Learningmeasure.tv Science and Engineering Podcast with Emphasis on Measurement Brought to you by David Archer and LearningMeasure.com Episode 14 Twinkle, twinkle, little star How I wonder what you are Hello, I'm David Archer, owner of LearningMeasure.com and LearningMeasure.tv This podcast is sponsored by TradePub.com, GoToMeeting.com, and is part of the Blueberry community of podcasts. Go check out Blueberry. they got a bunch of podcasts there. Kind of interesting. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about a little bit of news um, about LearningMeasure.com. We're going to have that every week, every episode. Um, LearningMeasure.com is a subscription-based training website associated with this podcast. Uh, When you register with LearningMeasure.com, you get two free weeks free, and then if you want to continue to access to the uh, course materials, uh, it's $5 a month subscription. Uh, That $5 a month helps pay for the website and this podcast and everything else that we're doing. Okay, a uh, new course has been just added, uh, Measurement 401, Basic RF and Microwave Power Measurement, which uh, contains most of the material from last, uh, uh, the last podcast plus a little more. Uh, and uh, we also added uh, Pearl 103, Pearl Forms and CGI. as the third in our series of courses on the Pearl pro- Programming Language. The other thing we need to announce from learningmeasure.com is we just uh, opened uh, our online store. It's at store.learningmeasure.com. Right there there you can order uh, DVDs of compilations of our podcast for to a DVD for $5 um, if you're interested in that. We will soon have also a compilation where you can buy five for the first 20 episodes, which this is episode number 20, um, for $20. So um, the other thing is we will be selling training manuals that is associated with the online course material. Right now we have uh, the first three of those on the, on the store, and that's the LearningMeasure.com measurement series, which covers most of the material from uh, measurement 101 through measurement 108 plus uncertainty 101 through one, uh, all three of our current uncertainty courses. Um, well, the subject for today's podcast is stellar magnitudes. Um, this is, was somewhat co- covered in episode 6, when I, but when I went back to look at episode 6, I realized, wow, the audio was missing. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to recover some of what was in episode six, and maybe someday I'll redo episode six because um, there was some interesting stuff in there. Anyway, uh, we want to uh, talk about stellar magnitudes. Stellar ma- magnitudes is a logarithmic scale like dB. Um, astronomers use magnitudes to characterize the brightness of stars. Uh, The concept of apparent magnitude went back to ancient Greek and Greece and uh, this guy here, uh, Hipparchus, who was uh, um, lived from 190 to 120 BC. Uh, He decided to divide the visible stars into six magnitudes, one being the brightest, six being the um, dimmest star that you could see with the naked eye. Uh, And then uh, this guy here, Claudius Ptolemaeus, also known as Ptolemy, who lived from 90 to 168 AD. He was an uh, astronomer, uh, geographer, mathematician. He also was an astrologer, which sort of went hand in hand with astronomy back then. He wrote a scientific treatise called the Almagest, in which he had a catalog of stars that were that were uh, broken up into magnitudes, which was, I guess, the first scientific 
paper that contained uh, magnitudes. And then uh, uh, that's how they, measured, they broke up magnitudes into six visible magnitudes based on these works all the way up to 1856 uh, when the British astronomer Norman Robert Pogson noticed that the first magnitude stars were about a hundred times brighter, hundred times brighter than the six magnitude stars and suggestion suggested that the standard for magnitude should be uh, each magnitude difference should be the fifth root of a hundred which is about 2.512 which is known as Pogson's ratio. Well what does, first of all, there were some words used in that sentence that we need to define. What is brightness? Um, let's say you have a star. You have some star here. Okay, it's radiating power in all directions. So if you put a sphere around the star, of radius r, Okay, that power, you've seen this before, the power per unit area is equal to the power radiated by the star in all directions, the total power in watts, divided by 4 pi r squared, the area of the sphere. So if all the power is, goes out evenly from the star, um, the power per unit area in a sphere around that star is that right there. Astronomers call this thing the brightness and they, they use the symbol B. Okay. So what is the other thing is this power in watts, the total power radiated in watts, watts P. Astronomers call that luminosity. They use the symbol L. Okay. So if you use, um, if you look back at the episode on dB, a dB is a power ratio. Well, magnitude is a power ratio. So, so the ratio between two magnitudes, minus m1, you know, the difference of two magnitudes is, um, yeah, is equal to 2.5, this is, Pogson's ratio approximately times the log base 10 of B2 over B1. So essentially, one magnitude is roughly a quarter of a dB. They're the same, same sort of thing. They're a logarithmic power ratio. Well, um, since we have relationship between brightness and luminosity now. Which is just relabeling power and uh, basically power density. We can, we can say some things. If we know, for instance, through parallax measurements, the distance to a star, we can figure out um, from this equation, we can figure out what the luminosity of the star is. How much power, how much energy per unit second is being radiated by the star using that equation. Well, one thing that we did in episode six, unfortunately, that was uh, lost is, well, if you could, from this equation here for the brightness, you could, you could figure out the distance of a, to a star if you knew, somehow knew its inherent luminosity. You know how much power per unit, uh, t how much energy per unit time is being radiated by the star. It turns out there's a class of star called Cepheid variables where, that are variable stars whose luminosity can be determined from its period. From that, basically from this equation then, you can use that to measure the distance to that star. And if there are Cepheid variables in other galaxies, which there are, and, and they can be resolved in some galaxies, you can determine the distance to the galaxy. 
Um, and uh, so fairly straightforward. Another thing you can do is that uh, most stars, their spectrum is consistent more or less with what's called a black body. Now if you've seen, if you basically take something like a container and heat it up and you put a hole in it, you'll see in the hole you'll see some sort of glowing stuff coming out. That's black body radiation. It turns out you can compute the luminosity of a star from its, if you know if it's a black body, from this equation, and I'm not going to derive it at all, but is 4 pi r squared sigma t to the fourth, which is essentially the, this r here now is a different r. Well, let's use this lowercase r. This is the radius of the star. So this is the surface area of the star. And this is uh, basically the power per unit area radiated by the star. So you can do lots of things with this. If you know the luminosity and you know the distance, let's say, you know, you know the brightness and you know the distance, you can figure out the luminosity. Um, you can figure out from, black, from the spectral measurement what this T is. So you can actually figure out the radius of the star from this equation. If you know the radius of the star some other way, for instance, you could measure it via um, uh, measuring the diffraction as it crosses, let's say, uh, this, the moon. Let's say the, the moon crosses a star. There's a method where you can measure the st a radius of a star that's not too far away. You can get the temperature that way. So you got all these things with basic magnitudes that you can measure uh, about a star. Um, but before we talk any more about stars, we need to pay some bills. So do you say I waste hours in traffic trying to get my clients' offices for meeting? In fact, I spend more time getting to meetings than I actually do meeting then I can't really be productive. Great no news who, for anyone who feels unproductive. There is an easier and more affordable way. Go to Meeting, the award-winning service that lets you hold meetings over the internet with people in multiple locations. Just log in to gotomeeting.com and start meetings with a click. Instantly, everybody sees your desktop on their computer screen. It's like meeting in person, but less expensive and less time-consuming. Meet from your office, home, hotel room, anywhere, anytime. Plus, you can hold as many meetings as you want for one flat rate. Try GoToMeeting today free for 45 days. Just go to meeting go to meeting.com slash podcast. That's go to meeting.com slash podcast. Do more travel less. Do more and travel less with GoToMeeting. Okay. Yeah, and eventually they might even have uh, go to meeting it on different stars. But um, Okay, where was I going to go with this? Okay, now we, we've got all these things that you can measure in, 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 in uh, magnitudes. Well, you could, with this equation here, divide both by 4 pi r squared. Okay, so that would just cancel that, and we'd have an r squared here. And then take 2.5 log of that. Okay. That's going to equal 2.5 log 10 of r squared over r squared sigma t to the fourth. Well, now you take the ratio of two different stars. So this is the brightness, right? So we could take 2.5 log base 10 of B2 over B1, which is the magnitude difference. And then you come do the same thing here.
So now you can express in magnitude difference between two stars. You can get the, if you know any of these, two of any of those three different quantities for each star, you can get the other one. So, or if you know e two of the ratios, you can get any of the other ratios. So you can come can figure out the ratio of their radiuses, the ratio of their distances, or the ratio of their temperature with magnitude measurements if you wanted to. Um, but like we say, magnitudes are a relative scale. Just like dB, you have to pick a reference for, like, for, for making an absolute. Okay, so in the case of like dBm, which we talked about in previous episodes, or dBw, the, let's say dBw, the reference is one watt. Well, in astronomy, they didn't, they had to pick a star as a standard reference. Initially, they chose Polaris because, you know, the North Star, because a lot of people, and most people are in the northern hemisphere. You can see it. Everybody can see it. But that turned, and it was a very, fairly bright star. But unfortunately, they found out later that Polaris is a variable star. So um, it turns out that they decided to use a star called uh, Vega, also known as Alpha Lyrae. Um, and uh, they chose that as a magnitude of zero. Um, now, the, when the magnitude scale was uh, originally chosen, of course, brighter stars had lower magnitude numbers. So it's, it's kind of like dB, but you, the reference is on top now. So um, instead of on the bottom, like in, in dBm. So, so at the absolute, the apparent, what's called the apparent luminosity, the absolute apparent luminosity is it's, it's going to be m minus m vega, which is zero, defined to be zero. And that's, of course, then 2.5 log b vega over b of the star, right? So m is equal the apparent magnitude that's equal to zero is that. Well, what are some examples of this? Uh, to put it in perspective, the sun has the sun has an apparent magnitude of uh, minus twenty six point eight from the Earth. Full moon has an apparent magnitude of minus twelve point six. Uh, Venus has an apparent magnitude of minus four point four. And the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, has approximate magnitude of minus 1.5. Now, the astronomers came up with another concept called absolute magnitude, which is different than apparent magnitude. Apparent magnitude is the magnitude we see from the Earth relative to some reference star. But if you see this brightness has this r squared term in here. Well, they decided to come up with an op absolute scale that was essentially equivalent to dV for power by setting r at some value. Now, astronomers like to use this strange unit called parsec. And as if you look back, I forget what episode it was, we talked about what a parsec was. A parsec is when you have the sun and the, you have the Earth and orbit around it, and you look at some star in the background six months apart, okay, it's going to, there's going to be some angle, change in angle for, over those six months to that star if it's close enough. Okay, one arc second it, change is equal to one parsec. So, for parallax second. Okay, so what the astronomers have chosen for a reference distance is 10 parsecs. Wow, the whiteboard just magically uh, got clean. Actually, we had a little bit of an incident and I had to, to uh, start the recording over and I thought I'd just leave the rest of it the way it was. Okay, um, where was I? Oh yes, we were talking about absolute magnitudes, or we we're about to talk about absolute magnitudes. 
where we've talked about astronomers picking a reference distance of 10 parsecs. Well, so we can talk about the brightness of a star at 10 parsecs, right? Uh, it's going to be, again, the luminosity over 4 pi. Well, in this case, it's 10 parsecs, whatever that is in meters squared. Okay. And that would give you power per unit area or brightness or power density at, uh, uh, that you observed. Well, then the difference in magnitude at 10 parsecs between two stars is going to be 2.5 log base 10. The luminosity, the ratio of the brightness is right, luminosity over 4 pi r squared. And then that's brightness and then divided by 4 pi is r2 r1 squared over l1, right? Well, if r1 and r2 are both at 10 parsecs, this cancels this. And so we have the absolute magnitude difference of 2.5 log base 10 of L2 over L1. Well, that tells you pretty much what absolute magnitude is. It's basically the absolute magnitude difference is nothing more than a, a logarithmic ratio of the, ratio of the powers emitted by the star. So this is like a quarter of a dB, okay? So this is the, the difference is expressed in a quarter of, quarter of a dB. To get an absolute magnitude, you put the reference star in there, which is Vega, so you figure out what the brightness of Vega would be at 10 parsecs, and you have absolute magnitudes for stars. Um, so, but yeah, conceptually, this isn't any different than using dBm to measure power. This is just a power measurement in what they call magnitudes. Uh, it's interesting how this stuff is done over and over again in different fields. All right, uh, uh, we'll be back in a minute after this ad. One of LearningMeasure.tv's sponsors is TradePub.com. TradePub.com is a site where one, one can sign up for a large number of free trade publications. If you'd like to support this podcast, uh, go to the LearningMeasure.tv site, scroll down to the free publications link and choose one of the magazines or one of the one of the publications or one of the categories and sign up through that link. Each pu publication subscribed to through this link on LearningMeasure.tv website helps keep Learning Measure TV on the air. Thank you for your support. Okay. There was one thing we failed to mention earlier is the magnitudes were based on what the human eye can see. You know, one was the brightest star human eye can see, and uh, basic magnitude six was the dimmest star that the human eye can see. Well, the human eye responds over a range of wavelengths or frequencies. It, it, like, we don't see x-rays, we don't see gamma rays, we don't see infrared. Um, so the human eye, has some sort of response with wavelength. It looks something like that. The human eye's peak is somewhere in yellow-green, and it falls off response on either side of that. And uh, so what somehow our, our magnitude scale so far has been tied to the frequency response of the human eye. But stars put out energy in all wavelengths. So this is just, we, what our magnitudes, we sort of average things up over the response to the U of an I and call that some sort of average power received. But you could put use some other filter with different response. You know, this, we'll call this visible. We, astronomers have defined some, some filters. That's not quite how that one looks. But that they can stick in front of their telescopes uh, to filter out different parts of the spectrum and get power over some other frequency bands. 
This one, the V filter, looks something like the response to the human eye, but not quite. And then there's a blue filter and an ultraviolet filter. So you can define magnitudes at, you know, over those bands by putting these filters over your telescopes and measuring power, maybe through, I don't know, CCDs, or maybe you can conceivably calorimetry, but that would be really, really hard to do. Um, so you, you could come up with a visible magnitude, right, uh, which is 2.5 log 10. This is basically what we showed before. Uh, the brightness in the visible of Vega divided by the brightness in the visible of the star you're looking at, you know, over this filter. Similarly, you can define one for ultraviolet and blue. Those are just three different magnitude numbers. Well, then you can do something with it that's kind of interesting. You can create these differences. Let's say B minus V, or U minus V are common. These are called color indices. Okay. What these, t since we've already told you star's spectrum sort of looks like a black body, the response with frequency, the, the power emitted with frequency, has a well-known shape. So these differences here give some sort, sort of indication of the temperature of the star. In fact, you can compute the temperature of the star uh, as if it were a black body with these uh, color indices. So you can tell which, if you're looking at two stars, you can tell which one's hotter, which one's bluer, um, you know, which one's redder. So given these numbers, you can tell temperature. Now, if you know temperature, you can stick it back in some of those previous uh, equations that we've shown. And you can determine things like the radius of the star or, you know, the distance to the star, maybe. Um, so it's amazing what you can do with just little observations here on, the, on our, our little uh, blue ball. Um, and that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about on this episode about stellar magnitudes. Um, Maybe uh, we can, at some future point, I'm going to redo episode six, I think, uh, since we've lost the, uh, the audio. Um, there was actually some interesting stuff in that one, um, I think, anyway. Um, but uh, unless I get something from you, I'm going to just head some random direction next week. Uh, and like I said, if you want to... Uh, see us do something or change something in the program, send us an email at suggestions at learningmeasure.tv. If you have any question at all, a science question, an engineering question, homework question, anything that has to do with science or engineering, um, well, actually, any, you can ask any type of question you want, and I'll decide whether I want to answer it on. I probably won't answer what I ate for breakfast, but you can, you can uh, give me some sort of question, and I'll try to answer it on the air if I can, or I'll find somebody who can answer it on the air. Um, also, if you're a vendor that has some test equipment software, or you're a consultant that wants to uh, advertise your services to our audience, we'd love to have you on the show if you're in the Vegas area, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll put you on. Just send, but send us, first send us an email at uh, vendors at uh, learningmeasure.tv. Uh, that's it for this week. I'll see you next time.